Um, Bruno uh, runs STT uh, GDC, uh, which has ASEAN coverage, India, and even into China, so a, a lot of aspect. Then Sridhar is Control S, it's a big player in the India market with also expansion plans and already expanding into the Middle East and to Southeast Asia. Pakistan has a Japan perspective from the ministry MIC, and Rory has a subsea being able to connect between the US, Asia, and even into Europe. So we have a really good panel here to go across section of opportunities and really get a different, different perspective of really guys that are in the, on the ground, in the weeds, doing the business and seeing all the different perspectives of what's going on. So let's get started. And let me just, you know, as we talked about what is the, the new Asia, and Asia's been a leapfrog type of market between not doing as much fiber going into the wireless sector. And really, I'll start with Bruno about this, is like, where do you see the next leapfrog within Asia of what, in your business or in general of what you've been seeing in different parts? And I know everybody says, you know, from the outside, Asia, but then there's so many different segments of North Asia, Southeast Asia, Oceania, you know, uh, you know South Asia of India. But where, you know, what can you talk to and what are some of the kind of data points from that perspective? I think, I think uh, thank you, Brendan. And uh, really great to be here. Uh, thank you. And I think uh, I'll expand in Asia as we are in actually eight countries already across India, China, and a lot of the Southeast Asian countries. Um, I think what we are seeing is that uh, the demand and opportunity is actually increasing. How is that? I think what's happened in the US with the 100 megawatt type deployments that you've seen in most of 23 is coming to Asia. We already see some of that happening here. The AI boom is going to filter in 24, 25 into Asia. And we see that coming through not just into the historical, traditional hubs of Singapore, Tokyo, Sydney, uh, uh, and Hong Kong, but also to the other countries that are becoming the new uh, second tier, but actually not really second tier anymore of markets. Uh, we see Malaysia, Indonesia, Bangkok, uh, driving some of that demand coming through. And I think it's exciting times for the business, but one thing we have to realize is not homogeneous. It's, it's not as easy to deploy that kind of capacity into these markets with its power challenges, land and regulatory issues. And I think the, the feat of delivering that kind of capacity into these geographies will be a different challenge compared to what's happened in the US. And I think that's going to be what's out there for data center players, both the hyperscalers as well as the, the, the data center providers. And that challenge is going to be something real that we we'll have to face up to in the coming uh, year and, and years. Maybe I'll... Yeah, uh, maybe Sridhar, you wanted to add a yeah, little bit uh, from... I, a... I will second that, uh, you know, Bruno. Uh, AI is the biggest, you know, factor, you know, which is making the industry leapfrog. Uh, I heard, um, you know, from 130 billion odd going to 1.8 trillion in the next six, seven years. And uh, same is the case with the semiconductor industry, you know, 50 billion going to 100 plus in the next two years. Uh, part of all these chips are likely to come to data centers. Good news for all of you in the industry. Um, and uh, same thing is happening for Asia as well. Apart from that, there are a couple of other things um, which are going to make a big difference to the industry in, in, in APAC. Number two is, second is the secondary markets. Uh, there are 16 cities in India with about three to four million uh, population and about 40 plus markets in APAC unrepresented by the data center industry, which have significant uh, market potential. I think that's what is another big uh, area that the you know, industry can tap into. And the third, uh, with respect to Asia PAC, you know, cloud is still the biggest driver of the business. The growth rates of cloud have declined uh, to a certain extent, but not of APAC, and uh, it is going to uh, create a 
you know, still continue to create a big demand for the industry. Gotcha. And Rory, maybe we'll switch now to the interconnection of subsea and what, in your, your angle of that, of what is that growth? I mean, we've heard, you know, through the conference, I was talking to somebody that there's going to be so much of a need for refresh of not just the technology, but the cables as the, the useful life is getting to a, the end of a lot of the useful life of the inter-Asia and even, you know, some of the ones coming from through the Middle East and to, to Europe and even the newer Asia's. Now there's new routes because of the issues with Hong Kong and we'll, we'll touch on the Hong Kong angle in, 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 down the road, but what are you seeing from a leapfrog in technology because so much capacity needs to go across the, the Pacific and then yeah. across in, into, into Europe? Yeah, great, great question. And I think building on sort of how the industry is gonna leapfrog in a way, yes, cloud is there, AI is there, digitization is there. It's absolutely a driver of demand. I mean, the benefit of all of this, the great thing for us is the thing that we have the most confidence in a way is a sustained path of demand. And so we see 30 to 40%, sort of high 30% year on year growth in the demand of data that's required. So our capacity has to be able to keep up with that. Um, we have to do that economically, obviously. And so, and at the same time, a lot of the systems that are in the water are starting to age. And so we're at this interesting point of what's the investment cycle gonna look like and how are we gonna continue to invest? Yeah. That's coupled with the fact that hyperscalers have started to be a much bigger player in the industry. If you go back you know, a few years ago, not that long ago, uh, the consortiums were operators and now the consortiums look very different. And so I think you know, the, the key there is how do you partner? The key there is how are you bringing together the multiple players that wanna work directly or indirectly or whatever that might be but we ultimately have to put more infrastructure into the water. Uh, we have to be putting more systems into the water and these are gonna be new systems and new routes and new diverse paths. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that's what you see. We've made a couple of announcements, but I think that's something at an industry level, we're starting to see you know, new hub cities emerging or new paths emerging, you know, different routes than have traditionally been there uh, with lots of different players involved in that and figuring out how to work those combinations to serve those needs is the key part. Oh, nice. And to, to follow on that, that question for Vatsan, you know, what strategies do you see being adopted in the response to the, these changing environments and the leapfrogging of stuff? And how, as more from the government or the ministry perspective, how are you either enabling domestic companies or international companies to kind of stay ahead of the curve? And Japan has always been the one of the ones from, from a technology, you know, has always been trying to push the envelope ahead. How do you, uh, one, see that, and then how does the ministry get involved with that? Yes, um, I think the uh, next leapfrogging technology area would be uh, AI, especially uh, generative AI. Uh, currently, at this, at this moment, uh, US and the European countries, and also China, is far ahead of other countries uh, in both uh, technology and uh, regulatory framework. From the perspective of government position, uh, let me mention about the regulatory framework for AI. Uh, when dealing with uh, new technologies, we should emphasize the uh, balance between promotion and regulation. Uh, at this moment, uh, many countries and international organizations are trying to establish uh, AI rules, but those approaches are quite different. And for example, EU is seeking to make legislation uh, to some extent to protect uh, human rights and democratic uh, values. Uh, on the other hand, US and UK rely on uh, market value and uh, private sector initiative. Japan is in the position uh, intermediate between US and European countries. So uh, last year we launched uh, a Hiroshima AI process to make a, a comprehensive policy. And last December, we reached an agreement uh, Asia countries uh, are not only a uh, market, uh, but uh, will be a player uh, for a AI development. So uh, I'm ready to, be, uh, Japan is ready to prepare, uh, uh, to share uh, our experience and the uh, outcome of Hiroshima AI process uh, with Asian, other Asian countries. Okay, Brandon, can I just, add, I mean, because I, th I think it's a really interesting point about how the role of governments in that process. And I think if we look at your question before about how do we see the interconnection between subsea data centers, if we look at Asia, the, the complication there is that the regulatory environments, you know, are 
probably not as fluid as some of the transatlantic aspects. And so what we found there is it's relationships where we can provide the commercial needs but also comply at a local regulatory level. And so some of it is about how do we work and partner together with government. So, uh, and there's lots of examples. We've seen that across Japan in many instances. We see that into, you know, Philippines as they open up telecom to be, have greater foreign ownership. We start to see, you know, in working into China, the complexity of that is what I'm sure we'll come to. But I think it's, again, that partnership yeah. of being able to build and grow and scale, but at the same time meet the local regulatory environment. And it needs to be a two-way dialogue. Yeah. No, and, and you're seeing that even in, in Southeast Asia and Malaysia with MDEC and, and all the, the, you know, you see that more and more that they're trying to get ahead of that curve or at least be more involved. But you're right, it's a longer process. And that's why I think in Asia, as we, as we all can attest to, it's a market-to-market -market demand driver. So let's kind of move on to the, you know, the, the China, and then we'll move into some Hong Kong and Singapore. Telstra International, it's, a, it's an Australian-based company as Telstra, but Telstra International has had its headquarters in Hong Kong. You, you have a, a deep uh, staff in Hong Kong, also you know, assets and, and employees in China. How has it been where, look, as an investor or a foreign company trying to come in Australia, you have to have five eyes, FERB approval has been very difficult. How do you balance that, and what what are you doing with your employees that way? Sure. And that balance of trying to do business in Hong Kong, doing business in China, and being a good partner to those telcos and those enterprises, but also having to balance maybe a government look through uh, as a you know large you know Australian listed company. Absolutely, great great question. Um, not an easy answer, I think. Okay. But at the same time, if I think about Hong Kong, I think about China. It's a very important part of the business for us. Um, there are lots of multinationals that have a need and a desire and, and customers, so they need to be able to serve that market. Uh, we've been a trusted partner for many of those businesses, and we continue to see that as a large growth area. So uh, we can talk about GDP growth rates and what will that look like, but yes, is growth slowing slightly in China from a GDP perspective? Yes, but we still see customer growth and customer demand, and, and that's an opportunity. I think, you know, at one point in time, yes, you know, Hong Kong was a central hub for us, I would say um, we're diversifying what our, our, our um, business looks like, and we're building out additional hubs. So um, that isn't uh, you know, a change from continuing to grow into China, but it's saying how do we grow other places, and how are we bringing different solutions that meet some of those other government needs. Uh, and so you see Singapore increasing, absolutely. You see Philippines increasing. We see Guam uh, increasingly important. Uh, so we see a lot of other countries building out connection points. And then we just sort of bring our team to those other markets as well. And so I think it's not a, in any way, um, you know, sort of a, a change. It's sort of with that growth, we will just point it towards slightly other places to meet different customers' needs. Okay. I'll, we'll get back on the subsea in Guam yeah. as, as what's going on there. Maybe, let's shift on to the, to the guys on the data center space of when in the last five, 10 years, when you said a tier one market, it was Tokyo, Hong Kong, Singapore, Sydney in the data center space. That was the initial. That was always yeah. like tier one, and then there was tier two, and then it was one and a half, whatever, and then, then Mumbai opened up and, and started to grow, and then, and then these other markets. Now that you know, you've got maybe uh, geopolitical issues of, of players going into Hong Kong, and you have a slowing demand from Chinese hyperscalers moving out of China, a slowing demand of US hyperscalers going into China right now, and you have power moratorium issues in Singapore, it's now opened the envelope a lot farther. I know in the last few years we, we've kind of talked, to, you know, everybody has gone deeper, but does that big shift or those two markets, does it really help you be able to drive your investors or drive your business cases to other places around the region? And, and what are those regions for you? Yeah, if, uh, I'll take that first and maybe Sri can jump in. I, I think the, the, challenge, the opportunity in Asia is real. I think if you think about the population, and you know data gravitates towards where people live, and that's where the story of our, our customers are as well. They want to go where people live. So historically, it's been you know, Tokyo, Sydney, Singapore, Hong Kong, and through, because of many reasons, Hong Kong for its own reasons, Singapore moratorium, there's a shift upwards. And that's happened for the last two, three years. And we decided quite early on that we will pick markets that are, uh, we, we see the horizon of that happening 
And that's where we went into Bangkok two and a half, three years ago, before the real demand really kicked in. Now it's kicking in. Indonesia, the same. We're seeing that happening in Malaysia. We're seeing that happening in the Philippines. Um, and we see that this, the moratorium was probably one of the reasons why this happened, but also in these geographies, a lot of the, the local governments want to go down the digitalization path themselves. And because of data sovereignty issues and wanting to keep data in country, that drove the growth of the data center businesses and, and uh, the sector itself. And I think that's exciting because you're talking about close to 4 billion, 3.8 billion people, one and a half or so each in India and China, and, and about, about 700, 800 million people in Southeast Asia alone comprising the 11 or so countries. And us, we believe that we wanted to go breath, extend beyond these markets. That's why we have talked about uh, all these new markets. And we're seeing the fruits of it today. A lot of the capacity that we're building up, we're seeing the take-up rates going up and the opportunity being there. And I think the, I think the regulatory issues that Ibatasan and you know, uh, Rory talked about is real. It's real in each geography, and it's not homogeneous. So every geography, we believe very strongly about having some local partnerships, so the partnership structure, local teams, think global, act local. Mm -hmm. Those are things which has helped us deal with the lack of homogeneity across all these uh, footprints. Because our customers are still the same. They expect a certain standard, a certain quality, they expect it to be delivered on time. And the challenges of delivering uh, 30, 40, 50, and now moving towards 100 megawatt type deployments is still the same. We have supply chain challenges across the globe, real in, in Asia, talking about transformers, generators, etc. delivery time moving from three to six months to nine, 12, 18 months. So that dynamic of dealing with all of this, and then you have uh, investors who, that, you are, that is in your ecosystem who expect you to be on below budget or on budget. So the constraints and the challenges to players in, this, uh, in going into these new markets are actually quite uh, varied. And it's no mean feat, I would say. In the last 10 years that we've been doing this, uh, it's been actually uh, uh, different, uh, what's happening in Korea in terms of a power problem or land problem is different from India, it's different from China, it's different from Indonesia. And that ability to deal with these varied challenges is going to be one that makes a difference into us as a sector delivering on our promises and what is uh, coming in terms of delivering on the AI story. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we'll... I have a... Uh... I totally agree with Bruno in terms of how the secondary markets are developing. Um, I see primarily three reasons why, um, why the question of secondary markets is coming up. Otherwise, all these cities are well established, telecom networks, subsea, you know, the whole ecosystem was existing there. Number one, uh, the biggest problem of the industry that is um, heavy concentration of the data centers worldwide. And, um, and the growth of our industry is such that uh, one day the city has to fail, and which is what happened. Uh, biggest concerns, suddenly data centers become the you know, center of attraction of the entire population as well as the governments, which led to moratoriums or you know, you know, different kind of blockages that we have seen, which led to the secondary markets. Uh, the, another important factor is uh, the data sovereignty laws. You know, data became extremely important political subject all across privacy laws and all governments want within their countries that led to the secondary markets. Uh, so that means that almost all the countries are going to get significant scale data centers. The third aspect is, you know, quality of services, um, especially, you know, content players and, um, you know, mobile telephony or the WhatsApp kind of uh, applications do require uh, a good quality of services which led to the secondary markets. And what's happening, 
Um, as a result of it in India, if you take, you know, started with Mumbai, quickly becoming, and I, I see a moratorium or something like that is coming, going to come up there in that city very soon. Um, so as a result, the secondary market started developing. In Hyderabad, we have seen now campuses. We are establishing a 300 megawatt campus. We had, uh, you know, it was a tiny market of 3 megawatt. It took 10 years. 10 megawatt, additional 10 megawatt in one year. And now we're talking about 300 megawatts. You know, these are the kind of a secondary market which are developing, uh, which I see in Johor. That's where we went to Thailand, established, you know, another uh, campus. Uh, I think kind of pretty much sums up mm. the uh, reasons about the secondary markets, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to kind of, as one of the data sovereignty or, you know, so maybe moving back to about San, about, uh, you know, about the data center space, as the data center space is developing these new AI DCs or power consumption, is there, do you look at it also from a data sovereignty perspective and what should the data center operators emphasize, but what is that, what that's looking like from a government or ministry perspective? Mm -hmm. Is there certain things that you're trying to focus on and communicate to the operators that are gonna be billed, Tokyo, Osaka, or other locations? What's important to the, to the MIC in, in your department? Yes. Uh, okay, uh, we should recognize uh, data centers is a, a huge power consuming facility. <laughs> so uh, we have to uh, seek uh, carbon neutral technology and then promote the green transformation. Uh, in addition, uh, the location of data center is a big issue. For example, in Japan, uh, data centers are concentrated in large cities, 60% in Tokyo area and 25% in Osaka area. Uh, I'm afraid this will lead to a vulnerability uh, to the uh, big natural disasters uh, like uh, that uh, happened in three weeks ago in Japan. Yeah, yeah, Japan yeah. is hit by a huge earthquake uh, of very often. So uh, in order to uh, overcome th those vulnerability, uh, I think uh, uh, new technology is required. Uh, as you know, uh, NTT, uh, the biggest telecom operator in Japan, has developed a new uh, optical network ne technology uh, known as ION. Uh, ION will realize uh, low latency and uh, less power consuming. So uh, I expect this new technology will contribute to the solution of these issues. Mm -hmm. oh, that, and Look, that, I think that's uh, uh, very relevant today, especially with the New Year's Day earthquake that mm -hmm. always, and a lot of people have talked about it, but you know, they never really think about it. And, and where does the government say, do they want to really shift to, to new locations? Are they gonna be supportive? Because it's always been about clusters and, and latency and proximity to other DCs or proximity to other subsea cables. Has there been thoughts on that perspective of how to develop a new DC campus zone or some type of, you know, as a third, a third city? Mm -hmm. uh, where in India or in, even in, in Malaysia, at least you have a couple locations. And, um, but really, everything is those two. And, and you're right, it's still the biggest market. What is, what is next for the MIC to think about those type of aspects? Is there something today that you're internally kind of developing as an idea? Uh -huh. uh, it's very difficult because uh, data centers are undertaken by private sectors, so the government uh, cannot uh, enforce uh, force companies to build uh, data centers here and there. But there's never been an incentive program. I guess that's the thing, is because you're, you're right, the cost of building is so high in Tokyo and Osaka and uh, TEPCO and KEPCO to mm -hmm. get power it's, it's five or seven years out. Is mm -hmm. there other areas? But right now the government cannot, is not really trying to lead that or hasn't been able to force people to, to push them. Is exactly, that exactly. Okay, I understand. But, uh, if, yeah. if I may just take yeah. up a point on innovation and, and, and you know, looking really at that for our sector, I think more so than ever, I think we have to challenge ourselves to deliver more innovatively the, the capacity that's mm -hmm. needed. And, understanding the power-hungry nature of what AI is expecting, high-performance compute, 
uh, all those uh, nice things. I think delivering that in, in situ, in the geography, sustainably, as well as innovatively, is going to be our challenge. And I think embracing some of these new technologies in liquid cooling, um, uh, you know, uh, immersion or not, et cetera, has been going to be something that we have to challenge ourselves as an industry and maybe take some lead in this, in this area and, and follow some of the things that are happening globally as well with all the, the various uh, deployments in the US, et cetera. But I think that gap to take on this technology has to be shorter hmm. in Asia. We are working, yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, we are working on two, three uh, initiatives. Uh, you know, number one, work on, as you said, you know, liquid immersion takes away at least one single step, takes away 20% of the entire power consumption. Uh, I think that industry with the new GPU chipsets getting there in the next one to two years, but the rest of the whole industry has to as well move on to it. Um, straight away sales, you know. In, in, in Singapore, we can add 20% capacity. In Ireland, we can add 20%. Virginia, we can add 20% capacity with simple change of server technology, as simple as that. Same data centers, by the way. Uh, and uh, second, um, that we could do as industry is go to where the power is. The concentration of data centers now uh, is unlike in the past, where data centers used to go yeah. to the cables. Yeah. But now, the data center capacities are so large that cables can come there, right? So, as a result, now the industry has a flexibility to go to where the power is, where 100% renewable power is, and where uh, it costs maybe half, you know? Those possibilities are there. That innovation will take away the entire problem of your cities. Mm -hmm. If, for example, you could do the same in Japan, mm -hmm. so show us those locations, we will come. Uh, there are entrepreneurs <laughs> like me who would be looking for those kind of opportunities. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> or I was talking to someone who is looking at an opportunity in Iceland. Possibilities are there. It is possible to decongest uh, because, because the cable, you know, uh, costs coming down and new possibilities, new routes um, to deliver and resolve all these issues at the same time, you know, create, yeah, sustainable growth. And, and so to get there, and we'll talk about now more on the CapEx side, yep. um, you know, there's, there's a broad topic of CapEx and, and the numbers that get, keep getting thrown out on, at least on the DC side, but even on sub C, because if you're talking about having to upgrade these, you know, it's, they're not cheap. Um, and y you see what's going on in the U.S., but the U.S. market is very different. And we'll always say that it's a little bit easier cost of capital, easier the flow through of funds to, to be available. Do you, are you seeing issues at, at raising capital? Or yes, people, I remember, Shido, I think you were, maybe it was one of the events in Singapore, you were on stage and said, yes, a lot of people call me and we're not ready to take outside funds, but you know, we're always looking, we're always talking, and everybody wants you know, a piece of the growth, and, and I get that, and you're trying to manage that, but how do you keep up or stay ahead of the curve in either land acquisition to development and, and, the, you know, and then doing this technology efficiencies? How are you kind of managing that you know, kind of private funds, public funds, debt to equity, and, and I'll share growth. my personal experience. <laughs> yeah. uh, I kept the company 100% private. You know, Bruno tried to acquire me several times. <laughs> um, talk I'm, to you I'm later. kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. He always wanted to. That that, that I know. But um, so uh, we kept it 100% private, and. Um, hardly any debt, like 1, 1.5 uh, EBITDA, the overall debt. And uh, I thought that's going to continue because uh, as the volumes grow, it is likely to come down, you know, the mm. component. And then but things have changed in the last two, three years significantly. And uh, all the data center companies have to change the way their balance sheets uh, are going to look going forward. The CapEx requirements, the, of course, the opportunities are the same. 
that you know, are also have gone multiple. So suddenly, from a data center company, you are transforming into a large infrastructure company. You know, you have to think like uh, probably you're building an airport or a, you know, road or reservoirs. Um, things have completely transformed for the industry. And uh, we're in the middle of it. And the um, last two years, we've been working uh, to, and, and we've been successful, I would say, fairly in, in kind of transforming the, the whole, uh, you know, financial structuring hmm. of the company. Yes. So what it means is that um, getting in more data lines, getting into structures, specialized structures with, uh, you know, large pension funds. Uh, which will unlock your, uh, you know, you know, uh, potential to invest. Okay. I, if, if I may, yeah. I think uh, I think many people wanted to buy Control S, but it's just too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> no, it has a lot more value than the market can give. <laughs> you could say. Yeah. So, so I, I think to on the capex point, I think the there has been a a, a shift in the in the investor wish list, so to speak, in the last 12, 18 months. No longer top line projections, exciting uh, PowerPoint presentation and spreadsheets will attract this capital. I think people are looking to have delivery profitably. And I think that's going to be the big issue that uh, going to be uh, challenging us uh, to deliver, to get secure some of this capital for the growth that we are seeing. I think uh, you have to be, the interest rate environment everybody knows has caused these things as well as private capital is also thinking very carefully, although they are, there's a lot of it, they're waiting in the sidelines to see what happens uh, and how we're going to, and they, they are in the driver's seat, so to speak. And we have a lot of opportunity today and I think the, the way to think about this is we must be able to deliver and track records important and we need to be able to demonstrate that and delivery to scale in these markets. And that's the challenge that we will all face growing into these uh, geographies. Um, how do we attract this capital ex with this renewed and higher expectations of return on capital? ROIC is going to be much bigger as opposed to just you know, aggressive projections and, 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 and spreadsheets that talk about it. But I think it's a great time to be in the industry. I, I think you would, you would be uh, uh, very challenged if you are just starting out in this sector. So I think we are very well placed that we are actually have a substantial platform already across uh, our geographies that we, we, we dominate. And, and allowing that growth to happen and, 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 and continue is just uh, leveraging the momentum that we are seeing and, and, and delivering this with the ROIC that the investors expect. Brand, if I could add, I think, I mean, it's exactly yeah, right. So it's, it's, that's it's, if I look about. at the subsea space, it's really interesting because um, I think you're right. I mean, in a certain way, Finding, um, finding capital, I won't say it's easy, but if you can provide a view of, and yes, we can all drag right on the Excel spreadsheet to plug in a number to get to a model that works, but I think it's the confidence in all those assumptions. Yeah. And I think if you have a model where you have confidence in the business and you have those relationships and the business demand on the other end, getting the economics to work is okay. And if you can get those economics to work, I think there's funding there. I think that's what we've seen. I think the big change I would say on the sub C side is it's about that level of risk and those confidence in your assumptions of growth and future demand. And that's where the hyperscalers come in because they are investing directly and they're playing a long-term bet here. And they look at what their demand profiles are. And so they can help anchor in some way some of those economics. But what it is is actually experience really matters here. So a bit to your point of being a new startup, you know, you need experience operating in markets that you need regulatory relationships, you need business partners, you need customers. And I think that's where, you know, just having money is great, just having demand is great, but actually having operating partners with experience on delivery, what we're finding is even more critical now today than ever before. And how do you, you know, look, the subsea business has, has been hard for financial investors and it's been mostly driven by the telcos, yeah. but how are you, 
uh, from the sub C side, and we can talk about the data center side, yeah. playing nice in the sandbox with your customer and your competitor, who yes. are the same people. Yeah. Um, and that's changed over the last five years, where, as you, you talked about before, yes, every, every deal was initially in, independently owned, then there was the telco club deals, and then it was, okay, we're doing a deal as a telco with a OTT slash hyperscaler. Yep. So how do you see that going forward in this replacement cycle that's going to be needed, and everybody's going to be needing to play a part in it if there's, if there's you know, more cables that are cut or degradation, that's going to be a big issue for everybody in the game. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think that partnership model is going to continue. Who's in the partnership evolves over time, but absolute partnership will be key. And to your point, it used to be consortiums of operators where we were competitors as well. Yeah. Right. And so now if we think about hyperscalers, you know, our biggest partners in most of our subsea deals are hyperscalers and that some of it will be to serve their demand, but some of it we will be helping them on other components as well. But it's back to my prior point. It's that experience in operations, the experience to operate landing stations, to operate the NOx, to run and op, you know, maintain the networks. And we have the expertise in that space. And so they see a lot of value in that. That's where we bring that partnership together. Mm -hmm. And we'll be serving needs that they have where they aren't going to own directly because they need to flex up and down at different times. But there's a whole another segment of the market which they won't necessarily serve. And we need to serve that market. We need to invest to be able to serve multinationals, governments. Um, other players that aren't going to be making direct investments and, and where the demand just continues to grow for all the reasons we discussed before. Yeah. And it, let me move to Batsan before one second. I'll talk to, uh, get back to you as the, one of the last questions on, on Batsan on the subsea side. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, look, Japan has played a big role in the direct connection to the West Coast and really be the, the jump off point into Asia, mm -hmm. uh, the inter Asia. Now, over time, more cables have gone through. Guam and or directly to Taiwan and Philippines and more even to Southeast Asia to India or Indonesia and then a couple even from the, the east coast of Australia. Where does the ministry play on that perspective of the value of how Japan plays with cable landing sites and, and being a prime player in the connectivity space for subsea around the region? Yes. Uh, as for submarine cable uh, from the government position, uh, national security perspective is important. Uh, we, Japan, uh, has ad adopted uh, a free and open Indo-Pacific Ocean strategy as our diplomatic policy. So uh, submarine cable is a very important factor. And uh, uh, two things are important to uh, maintain uh, resilience and national security. Uh, first is um, uh, securing multiple routings. And the second uh, is uh, maintain, uh, establish a maintain and uh, protect system. Okay. And that's, and are you playing an active role in that? Or again, yes. it's more trying to at least uh, Educate or at least uh, uh, you know be working with the operators on mm -hmm. these points. Exactly, exactly. Okay, I understand. So let's go back to then you know from the subsea side of you know kind of friendly enemies and frenemies and all of that. <laughs> <laughs> no, we are friends. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, not you two. I'm talking yeah, about yeah. the hyperscalers. You guys are friendly. I mean, <laughs> but yes, it's they needed you colo build a suit. We're going to self-build, and the, the needle moved to more self-build than the Cola build a suit With this capital swing and these demands of going from 20 to 50 now to 50 or 100 or a runway to get to you know, that size of a campus, how are you seeing that kind of relationship, maybe pendulum moving back to a more even or being able to start to get better, get better pricing? Because pricing was definitely being compressed. Uh, yeah. But how does that work for you going forward, and is it, how is the relationship today with, with your friends? Yeah, I, th I think the, the thing is volume and the demand that we are seeing does not allow for one or the other to, 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 to survive without working almost in partnership in, together. We see our customers wanting to see whether they can capture some of the urgent opportunities quickly, but they definitely need colo, and we're seeing a lot more of that. We saw the pendulum swing back to more colo because 
just the, the demand and the volume of the demands just uh, skyrocketed. And I think the complexity of Asia, and I think Srida will probably talk to that, to try to deliver all of these with, as I mentioned, the tra track rec the regulatory issues, local laws, power issues, availability, makes the delivery uh, issues uh, very dependent on how you know what's happening on the ground. And that's the reason why I think the dependence on Colo will actually become a lot more uh, in these uh, geographies as it expands. And the broadness and the reach means that hyperscalers cannot be everywhere yeah. uh, and, and, and deliver that kind of capacity in the timely fashion that's required. Uh, so I think that's uh, shifting the pendulum closer towards the Colo players. But I think the way we have to structure the deals have to be more creative. The old way of just you know, build them in a, in a data center and then that's it. We have to look at structured deals, uh, you know, build to suit and other such options that brings the whole cost up. Because the, the inflation cost, the cost of the, the supply chain issues have increased the cost of doing business. And I think the, our partners and our customers understand that. And they are prepared to work through that. Yeah. Maybe. Well, I a few factors up? that come to my mind. Yeah. Yeah. Number one, <clears throat> efficiencies. I have seen uh, there is a 50% efficiency in colo operators. In case of control, is 70%. Um, <laughs> sorry. Mental, mental man. Uh, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, compared in, in, with respect to timelines, right? Uh, Controllers builds in 12 to 14 months. I'm not pitching, this is a real story. As against the hyperscalers who normally take four to five years. Right? And second, CapEx. A hyperscaler typically spends anywhere between 1.5 to 2.5x the per megawatt as compared to colo players. Then the other aspects. Uh, of just in time. The business demands, uh, when I see the hyperscaler cu customers, they themselves don't know what to expect, right? You know, we have seen it in AI, we have seen that happen in, in the cloud. That matching the business demand with their capacity creation, added to the complexities of building and permitting and, you know, making availability of land, cables, you know, you know that mismatch, plus, in addition to all of this, then opening of secondary markets, right? You know, the cloud has to go, and data sovereignty loss, all of those. Opening, I see opening up 30 to 40 new markets in the next 10 years in APEC. Impossible for um, doing uh, more than 20 to 30% of their capacity self-built, even though if they want to, hmm. even if they want to. Right, so, so the case rests. It is the colo, which is going to be here, mm. and going to continue to grow. Okay, well, thank you all, gentlemen. I mean, we've kind of run out of time. We could probably be here for another hour, uh, and we've been <laughs> getting some questions, but uh, round of applause to these great gentlemen on the stage. Thank you.